Good day, listeners, and welcome again to the Three Feet Radio Show. It's the third interview of four interviews this week, and joining me today is my co-host Luke Herbert. Good day, Luke. Good day, Ben. And today we're changing things up a little bit, but we've had some feedback from our viewers, so we like to take it on board, don't we, Ben? We most certainly do. And listeners and viewers, you'll get our um, contact details later on in the audio version of this um, podcast. And you can contact us about um, what kind of guests you'd like. And someone contacted us and said, um, can you get someone on that does, some, um, does the stats? And joining us today is Nine Netball Analyst. I'll take that, I'll take that again. And joining us today is Nine Netball Analyst, Stats Analyst in Michael Hutchinson. G'day, Michael. How are you today, mate? Hey, not too bad, guys. How are we both going? Yeah, very well, thank you. Obviously, Suncorp Super Netball times with finals um, is, is a busy time. ANZ Premiership's finished. But first of all, just to get things done, just to get things going, what exactly do do you do as a stats analyst for um, Wide World of Sports Channel Nine um, netball coverage? Um, well, usually in a, a non-COVID year, I'd be sitting courtside with um, with the commentators um, and running through or, or searching through the champion data stats to find um, any bits of um, interesting things that are happening within the game. Um, looking at any sort of comparative data, if there's big discrepancies, looking at um, Super Netball and perhaps those teams um, from a historical perspective as well. Um, so delivering um, and feeding through some some interesting bits to the commentary team to hopefully speak out during the game. But, um, you know, that sort of analysis is sort of complementary to the broadcast. So it's not something that um, is um, sort of overused, I guess, in that sense. It's the commentary is really there to tell the story of what's happening on court and, and the statistical analysis is there to be, um, to complement that. And just sticking with stats for a moment, but um, I'll ask you two questions, the first one and then a follow up, but have you seen the film Moneyball or read the book that it was taken from? I actually haven't. I know what Moneyball is about, but I, I haven't watched the movie, believe it or not. Well, I was going to ask you as a follow-up if you thought that was a good template for finding netball talent and stats, but I think that we'll have to chase that even if we talk to you again in the future because I think there's an interesting conversation right there. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure that... I guess when you're looking at athletes who are being talent identified and coming through the pathway, I don't think a stats is something that's used equally across every pathway or every association. So I think to, to draw a list of, you know, athletes and their statistics is probably not going to be um, too helpful in that sense, particularly when you've got to look at an athlete or, um, on court. Um, and there's other components that you sort of take into account when you're looking at identifying athletes, you know, it's their attitude, it's their work ethic, it's how they combine well with other athletes um, and the role that they play on court. Sometimes you're looking for an athlete who's going to fit, um, you know, a certain um, mold for, um, you know, a higher age group or, or further along the pathway. That's not necessarily something that you can pick up um, purely for stats. And uh, I guess like broadcast stats are supposed to complement, um, you know, every other element of, of the game as well. And not, you probably wouldn't coach um, simply based on a bunch of statistics either. What's it like, Michael, to work along, alongside such well-known names such as Liz Ellis, Kath Cox, Sue Gordian, obviously Quint Stanaway hosts in Melbourne sometimes as well. You know, what's it like doing that? Horrible. They're absolutely horrible. Um, no, it's a, <laughs> lot of, <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun. They're really um, relaxed, but they're incredibly hardworking. Um, they, they certainly don't rock up and just, um, you know, sit behind a mic and, and think because they played the game on old bit about the game that they, um, you know, can just say whatever they like. They're, they research, and, you know, they spend hours every week researching um, as, as much as I do into putting stuff together for, um, for commentary. Um, you know, Kath Cox loves to snack pre-game, mid-game, post-game. Um, they're all incredibly intelligent. They're all incredibly funny. Um, there's certainly been a couple of laughs at a couple of broadcast dinners after games. Um, so I'm, I'm really lucky to have been able to, um, to work alongside people that, you know, I've certainly looked up to over the years as well, um, not just as players, but certainly in that broadcast space as well. And how do you do the homework? Do you like watch the previous rounds games? Do you do any? Do you look for anything in particular? I hate to admit it, but I probably watch every single game every year. 
um, and sometimes more than once for some games or at least look at um, parts of games. Uh, and then there's probably a lot of analysis that happens through um, sifting through all of the, the data that's collated by champion data. There's, I think there's probably about 18 PDFs and four or five spreadsheets that get sent out every week. So I sort of sift through that um, and generate some previews for the upcoming matches as well and sort of a, an analysis on the matches that have been played on the weekend, see if there's any records that have been broken or any milestones that are coming up or anything like that. Um, yeah, so I, I spent, I've spent quite a bit of time looking at um, stats over the past couple of, the, couple of years and this year's probably been a little bit... Um, uh, it's it's not it's not been more difficult, but it's it's certainly been more time consuming given that they played two rounds a week. Um, so the breaks from netball have been few and far between this season. And with COVID, how has that worked um, for you, Michael? Because I know they've been up in the hub playing in Queensland, and you're here you're in Melbourne. So what's what have you what have you had to do? The previews have essentially stayed the same. They do have a, a stats guy in, in Brisbane um, yep. this year or in Queensland. So mm. that's been really helpful. Um, and I tend to try and still watch and look at the champion data stats, given that they are updated in real time and send through some, some little tidbits every now and then at, at the quarter breaks. I don't send them during the, the quarters generally, um, given that you don't want to have commentary looking at their phone whilst they're trying to call a game and listen to a producer and look at the stat sheet themselves and all that kind of stuff. So um, I've tried to keep um, as distanced as possible in that sort of sense, but still tried to contribute as well. And just speaking of contributing, can you tell us about your roles and how, sorry, can you tell us about your roles that you've had with men's netball and what you do there off the court as well? Um, so I've just finished up three and a half years at the Australian Men's and Mixed Netball Association on their executive um, in this um, strategy and development role. I was a caretaker um, in that role for six months and then marketing communications for three and a half years. Um, so that was really about um, leveraging the sort of stuff that had been done and continues to be done and then in that executive space and telling people about it. They really hadn't had anyone in that media role um, ever. And so I was really headhunted um, from, from what I'd done at Netball Scoop to really um, transfer, you know, those skills into that space with Amna. Um, and I've just um, agreed to become the Victorian Men's and Mixed Netball Association Sponsorship Manager. So that's something that I've, I sort of did in a revenue space with Amna um, in, in regards to their live stream for the Australian Championships. Um, and so, yeah, so that's a, a new role for me. It's, it's a little more um, localised for me. Um, and, yeah, keen to get stuck in and see how um, the association can move forward post, post this COVID um, sort of time frame, um, given that it's probably going to be a little bit of touch and go for, you know, major sporting competitions in, in terms of sponsorship and revenue over the next few years. Um, for an amateur sport like men's and mixed netball, um, we don't know what that's going to look like, um, but our product is really good. The athletes are, are phenomenal. So um, hopefully we can make some, some moves in that space. You say the product is really good. What sort of things do you feel, Michael, you have to do or you have done to try and drive that profile a little bit? Because you look at, say, the Silver Ferns, they play the men quite regularly and it got a, and it got a lot of media coverage and it was on Sky last year. And the New Zealand um, public, they absolutely loved it. So it's definitely something that, that, that can happen. It's just a matter of time. But then there's also issues with NA not always recognising men and that's for another day too. But what, what do you need to do to, for that kind of thing to happen here in Australia? Well, I do know that men's netball has been put on the table in regards to this state of the game review mm. um, and that AMNA were approached and have had conversations with Netball Australia regarding the Netball Voice Survey. So that's been mm. um, phenomenal. Um, but I think it depends on what the strategic view for men's and mixed netball is by Netball Australia moving forward. Um, if they're investing in an elite product, then is the responsibility of the pathway and, and grassroots level going to continue under the AMNA umbrella or do women's um, the women's member organisations really absolve all of all of that responsibility and there is a change to how that operates um, at a state level that's really unsure um, but what I 
certainly had identified in the AMNA space was that AMNA really needed to figure out its identity, um, given that the majority of people um, who operate within the state committees and with the AMNA executive um, all come from within men's netball. I was the first person on the AMNA executive in I don't know how many years who actually came from outside of men's netball. I'd never played through the Victorian men's and mixed pathway or coached or umpired. I played socially with friends for um, a decade outside of high school, um, as well as association level under the age of um, 13. Um, but yeah, given given that there's, um, it's everyone's amateur in terms of their experience, in, in terms of their view of what should happen, um, there's probably some conflicts of interest that probably need to be resolved, but identity is, is really the first big issue about what AMNA's um, role and responsibility is as the governing um, association of men's and mixed netball um, and how that um, moves forward. But participation is something that needs to certainly um, be a real focus moving forward, given that there are over 100,000 boys and men that play netball around the country, and yet we have an Australian Championships that only caters for about 650 to 700 of those. So where are the other tens of thousands being able to play through the men's um, member organisations at the minute. I certainly um, cannot see that, that there'd be, you know, even 10,000 boys playing across those member organisations. So how do we capture those boys and how do we actually filter them through that pathway so that if it comes a time that we do have an elite product, we certainly have, you know, a funnelling of players through the pathway. And just speaking professionalism, and by professionalism I mean the running of the, the men's side of the game just for a moment, not necessarily the money involved, that's a different discussion on professionalism, but isn't this some of what, uh, if I might say it this way, the rest of netball has faced over the last two decades? They faced all those questions around how do you govern the sport, development pathways, and even what the competitions we play in Australia need to look like. Is there anything in common there, or am I reading this completely wrong? Well, there's there's probably similarities, but I think. The overarching issue is that Netball Australia is recognised by Sport Australia as the only netball governing body in the country. AMNA doesn't have that recognition. The, the players can't even wear the coat of arms on the Australian uniform. So there's that lack of recognition at that level that, um, you know, is holding us back. But I think there is an, an amateur sort of um, viewpoint um, overarching for AMNA and the member organisations at the moment. If you look around the members, I think five out of the seven um, presidents are either current or former open men's or men's reserve athletes. Um, and given that some of them are still playing, how is it that you can still have a viewpoint of, um, you know, trying to funnel through athletes through your pathway when there seems to have always been this glimmer of hope that there's going to be an elite product at some point, you know, that, that somehow Netball Australia have to eventually give in. Um, but I think uh, integrity and governance are the two most important things that need to be looked at in terms of um, having a product that Netball Australia actually wants to be interested in. If Netball Australia are going to gift something to men's netball or to create an elite product, there has to be some benefit for netball overall. It's not something that they're going to simply hand over to, to AMNA or, or to, to men playing netball. Um, there needs to be a, a greater, um, I guess, appreciation of, of what needs to be done um, in the lead up to, to having that. It's, it's a bit of chicken or the egg. Do you focus on participation first before you are rewarded with an elite product or do you have an elite product um, where you hope that there are more boys who, who want to um, end up playing the game and then you have to worry about your structures and your pathways and whether they fit in through the AMNA, AMNA umbrella or through Netball Australia. Um, so it's a big conversation and I'm sure we'll find out more once this state of the game review has been completed. And just back on your role with Nine Netball, Michael, obviously executive producer is Kiwi Devery, former Diamond. I've had a little bit to do with her myself over the years. Um, what are your experiences of working with her? Um, she's very, th um, my experience is that she's very thorough, very professional, and she just wants to produce a good product to get it out there for everyone to, to watch. Yeah, she's she's amazing. Um, mm. To think that she's been involved in in broadcast, not just in netball. Um, rugby too, it's um, for, um, rugby as well. Yeah, for mm. over twenty five years now. So mm. she's had she's incredibly experienced. She knows how to get a job done. Um, she really knows how to guide a team and get the best out of those that she's you know teaching around her as well, which is really great. And I'm you know really grateful. I mean, Sue Gordian basically. 
um, um, texted me in at the end of 2017 and asked if I, you know, wanted to get involved in stats um, and and sort of help out in broadcasting that way because they didn't have a statistician for the entire season in 2017 of Super Netball except for the grand final. That was that was the guinea pig game, um, and and Keely, you know, rolled with it right from the word go. So I'm. Um, really lucky to have had people who have been, you know, wanted to afford me an opportunity and really encouraged me to continue in that, in that realm. Um, but yeah, Keely's, Keely's great. She knows um, how to take the edge off things. She knows how to relax. She's, she's great at briefing a team before we go to air. She's great at debriefing after the game and, and gives feedback to, um, to the team in terms of, you know, what to, what to do for, for next time and, and continuing um to evaluate the product to make sure that the netball and nine are putting their best foot forward to make sure that super netball's, you know, incredible every single time that you watch it. Do you see this as a stepping stone for you now that you've got your foot in the door at channel nine? Do you see yourself ever moving up to like a presenting role or one of those sideline or color commentary roles? Uh, I've probably got more of a face for radio, but um, I don't know. I'm, I'm really lucky that I've been able to do so many things in the sport, play and coach, um, you know, marketing, work, had time at Netball Scoop as a writer and, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and commentate as well, commentated the, the four years of, um, or the three years of the Australian Men's and Mixed Championship live stream, commentated through the Victorian Men's and Mixed M League finals. Um, so I've sort of ticked um, all of the boxes. I think the only thing that I sort of, had dreamt of, of wanting to do when I um, started watching netball back in the late nineties. And I know I'm showing my age there um, was to commentate. And I've been able to do that. If I'm ever, you know, I've tapped on the shoulder or afforded an opportunity to commentate super netball, I certainly wouldn't knock it back, but I, I think I'm a little way off that at the moment, but um, you never know what, what the future's going to hold. You mentioned netball scoop. That's how um, we met Michael a number of years ago now. So um, what did you, what, what did you learn from, um, from working working for a website like that as a web, as a writer and an editor because um, one thing I always know is I did I did writing on and off for netball um, for nearly 14 15 years since stretching from the old CBT up until um, ANZ then Suncorp Super Netball is the fact that there doesn't seem to be as many egos as say in a lot of other sports and and, and generally all the athletes are genuinely um, are genuinely interested in promoting the sport and pushing it forward did you did you find that and um, can you see yourself uh, secondly, uh, coming back to Netball Scoop or another organisation to do a bit more writing um, in the future? Um, well, to the first point, yeah, I think um, I think because Netball sort of always hoped for more than it's received, that's mm. why you find mm. that the coaches and clubs um, and athletes are generally quite accommodating and happy to chat. Um, mm. And I think one of the things that that certainly um, I remember about my time at Netball Scoop was that the writers were able to forge really great relationships with people. Um, mm. And I think that that's, you know, largely held them in good stead. Um, I really enjoyed my time at Netball Scoop. I, I can't believe that I was given a chance to sort of learn in that space. I spent, um, you know, I was part of the first forum before it was Netball Scoop back in 2000 um, that, that was eventually absolved into um, the media side of Netball Scoop nearly nine years ago. I think Netball Scoop turns nine in December. Um, so to be able to, to write and, and to work with other writers who are far more experienced than I were, to be able to dip my toe into the social media side of things and basically be given free reign for four years, to chair the, the committee for two years and, um, you know, to make all sorts of mistakes and hopefully, um, you know, I've left um, that group in a, in a better position than I found it. I'm, I'm quite lucky because I don't think a lot of people really have that opportunity to, to have something like that as a stepping stone. Um, and now that I've got a podcast as well, which is something that we touted four years ago when the committee was formed. But um, at that time, we were probably lacking a couple of numbers and resources in that um, personnel space. Um, so the fact that it's gone on to continue to grow is um, really encouraging, not just for the people who are involved, but certainly for the sport. I'm not generally someone who tends to go back to things. Once I sort of move on from somewhere, I sort of, um, 
you know, leave it, leave it with goodwill and, and, and let, let it, you know, do its thing with the next crop of people. Um, I don't miss writing at all. <laughs> I think my writing got worse as um, time went on, but uh, who knows? Uh, I guess, um, you know, I love the analysis side of things and um, I've certainly loved the analysis from a stats point of view. I know I tried to, to chuck in a couple of stats when I was, I was writing at Scoop um, for sure. Um, but who knows? I've, I've been thinking about a podcast for a while, but that takes a fair bit of commitment. So, um, so yeah, I, there's, there's plenty of spaces to sort of dip my toe in um, and plenty of avenues that I'm still interested in. I'm really keen on the strategy and innovation side of things of the sport, um, both with, you know, the men's game and the women's game. So, um, so yeah, we'll see. My, um, my phone's always turned on and my DMs are open. So um, we'll see what happens. I hear you on the strategy and innovation side of sport. I take an interest in that. And well, we obviously don't discuss on this show for obvious reasons. But my interest in military history also breeds books of different innovation that is very different to netball. But putting aside that, um, how did you get ever, I think we missed this at the start amazingly, but how did you get started in netball? Funny story. Um, my mum coached and umpired at the local club. And she came home, I think it was, it must have been a Tuesday night after training and said, do you want to fill in for a game on the weekend? This team's only got five players. And my two of my younger sisters were involved. One was playing and one was um, at Netta, which is now Net Set Go. And I said no, because I didn't want to wear a skirt. I thought boys had to wear a skirt to play netball. That's, that's how little I knew back then. Um, and my mum sort of looked at me and said, well, boys wear shorts. Um, but that still wasn't enough to convince me. But the following Tuesday, she came home and she said, that team with five players won on the weekend. Are you sure you don't want to have a crack? Um, and I thought, well, if I'm going to be at least a sixth player, then, you know, surely I'm only going to be a benefit to the team and was probably a bit keen then at 10 years of age to get a bit of sporting glory under my belt. So, um, so that was basically my start and played with that club until I was 13 years old. Um, and then boys, you know, aged out, as I still think they do some 20 years on um, at association level. Um, gave the game away for a couple of years because I didn't know that there was any other avenues. It was early days of the internet. So it was really hard to find out um, about, you know, any other programs for just boys. Um, and I do, you know, Victorian Men's and Mixed Netball Associations has existed now for 35 years. And I wish I'd known back then that, um, there was another avenue for me. Um, so I picked up playing again in high school, year 11 and 12, and then played socially for 10 years. Um, got injured, and that's, you know, when I um, started writing for Netball Scoop. So there sort of hasn't been any real downtime um, from when I started playing at 10 years of age to now. Um, and I've been able to tick off a couple of spaces in the sport as well, which has been um, really really excellent for me you know if you told me if you told that 10 year old boy that you know i'd be where i am now i, I certainly wouldn't have believed you um i didn't know that i would grow to love the sport so quickly and um um want to have such you know an attachment to it so so further on from from you know those early couple of games it's a very similar story to dan ryan the new leeds rhinos coach who we're actually going to be speaking to tonight michael very exciting news with them signing Jay Clark as their first ever um, player. He was um, he, he he tells the story of how he was sitting in the pusher when his mum was playing, and then one thing led to another, and then he started playing. So you and Dan sort of have a sort of a similar story because you two are probably two well-known guys in a traditionally um, female-dominated sport. Yeah, and I, I think probably a lot of boys have had similar sort of um, beginnings, particularly guys of Dan and. Um, my age, we're, we're of a similar age. And so probably our introduction is, and a lot of guys at that age is probably through um, our mothers or our sisters um, and, um, you know, watching it being played out and thinking, oh yeah, I could probably do that. And, um, and, and having a crack. And um, I'm sure, you know, Dan would say the same thing that, you know, we've been um, incredibly fortunate to, um, have been involved in a, a female dominated sport because there are, you know, some people out there who think that netball should remain um, female only across, you know, pretty much every aspect of um, the game, which is uh, disappointing if you want to cut out, you know, half of 
you know, a potential audience really, you know, you want eyes on the sport, but you don't want us to play or coach or umpire or manage or um, anything like that. You know, Dan and, and I are huge advocates, I know, for women being involved in, in sports that are dominated by male participation. Um, you know, so I, I don't see why that netball should be the outlier here and, and remain a single gendered sport. But, um, but yeah, we've had pretty good careers. Uh, so far, he's certainly been far more successful than me, but um, you know he certainly worked hard for for what um, he's achieved and the position that he's in now. And and I'm certainly going to be signing up as a as a Rhinos member um, in the next couple of weeks to um, ensure that they have a really successful first season. All right, thanks very much for joining us today, Michael. It was good to get a perspective from someone who does something that people may not always know that he's there um, while they're watching a game of netball. Thanks very much, guys.